Blessing the Holy Spirit, God, and then may the Lord bestow upon us his blessing in the days and wisdom that will never today each of us. Amen. Today is the first Sunday of the blessed month of Tuba, and uh, we continue the historical count after the birth of our Lord, as we have been seeing right during the blessed month of Kiev. We, we read, as we said last time, the Sunday Gospels from the Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 1, right? And then Last week, as you know, we celebrated the Feast of the Nativity of the Lord, which we read the first part of, the, of this chapter of the Gospel, according to St. Mark, Matt, sorry, St. Matthew chapter 2, right? So in, on the Feast, we read St. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and today we started with the Gospel um, uh, uh, in the verse, chap, uh, verse 13. So <clears throat> during this month, um, we celebrate four Feasts of the Lord, two major and two minor, right? We celebrated already. Which feasts? The Feast of the Nativity, which is major or minor? Major. And then the Feast of Circumcision yesterday, which is minor. Right? And then we have two more. This coming week, we have the major feast of the Theophany or the Epiphany, um, Thursday or Wednesday night. And then three days or the, on the third day, so that same thing, we celebrate that feast for two days, um, just like for Nativity. And then on the third day, we celebrate the minor feast for the Lord's first miracle at the wedding of King of Yah. <clears throat> so this, this month is, is filled with many, actually just these two weeks are filled with many uh, special events in after the coming of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so here we see in the Gospel of today, St. Matthew um, fast forwards a little bit after um, the birth of the Lord and then the visitation of the Magi, which didn't, as we said last week, didn't happen immediately, um, but there was a period of time. Um, <clears throat> then the Magi came, and that um, brought to the re realization to King Herod uh, of what was going to transpire. Right, <clears throat> And um, the Holy F Family flees into Egypt as a result of God's direction through the angel. And sometimes God wants us to flee instead of fight. Um, and... Uh, Although uh, Herod was a very bad person, as we know in the history, um, we still have some or a lesson to learn from him. Um, <clears throat> and just like uh, the, God, the Lord in the Gospel according to St. Luke, when he, he um, the parable of the unjust steward, he teaches us that even the children of the world teach, should teach, have something to teach the children of God in their shrewdness or in their um, uh, care for for uh, the things re relating to their future. We'll get into that in a minute. So um, what can we learn from here? Um, in verse, I believe it's 16, um, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, was exceedingly angry, and he sent forth and put to death all the male children. Of course, this is very bad who were in Bethlehem and all his districts from two years old and under. So this shows us that it didn't happen immediately after the birth of Christ. He was around two years old when uh, the Holy Family had to flee, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. So what, what do we learn from this is that Herod quickly took care of the potential threat to his kingdom, right? He liked being a king, and he was actually a king for many years. I think history says about 38 years. And this was towards the end because he's, he's old and aged. And um, as we see, he's, he's about to die very soon, right? Um, but he still took care of the threat that, to his kingdom by eliminating what he thought was going to be a threat to, to replace his kingship, which, of course, the Lord said, my kingdom is not in this world, right? <clears throat> so in a sense, what we learn from this is that when we see a threat to our heavenly um, royalty or being children of God or our future inheritance in the kingdom of God, we have to eliminate um, whatever potential threats or the little foxes, as the Song of Songs says, um, that threaten our holiness or that threaten our growth. So in the Song of Songs, it says, catch the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for I've, our vines have tender grapes. And the fathers sim symbolize this or um, relate this to our spiritual life is that we are 
um, the um, Christ is the vine, right? Um, and we are the branches, right? And our goal is to bear fruit worthy of repentance. But if there's anything that threatens our virtue or our holiness or our um, uh, ability to bring forth fruit to God, then we have to take care of those threats, um, just like Herod did. <clears throat> so um, this is what we must do for our eternal life. Um, and as St. Paul says to the Corinthians, therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Right? Um, and so another lesson we have from Herod um, is that he wasn't too proud to get advice and information from others, right? So even though he was a, a proud person, right, as we know, um, uh, he, he was keen to take care and to get gather the pertinent information in order for him to be successful. Of course, he wasn't successful because he was fighting against the will of God. But nevertheless, we learn from this, okay? So um, if we... Uh, back up a little bit into the Gospel of the Nativity. Um, like I said, just a few verses from where we started today. Um, it says that um, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod, the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? Um, so he was not aware, most likely, of the birth of Christ until this point in time, until the Magi came to him. Um, and then the St. Um, Matthew writes, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Um, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So once he heard something that bothered him, he gathered information. He brought the scribes and, and, and the, uh, of the people and the chief priests um, and he wanted to know, okay, where? How did they know where? The gospel tells us. How do you think? The Old Testament prophecies uh, prophesied that he was to be born in Bethlehem. Right? It also prophesied that he was to be a Nazarene, according to what St. Matthew says here. Um, and he, it also prophesied that he would be um, from the tribe of Judah, as many, as well as many other prophecies. <clears throat> so, um, even though he was not a faithful believer in God, he was able to find out through the proper information where the Christ was to be born. Um, and uh, then he secretly called the wise men again. So even though he, he didn't believe what the wise men were doing, he believed the threat. And so he took action. Um, and he determined... Um, what time the star had appeared, because they told him this was the way that they found out. And then he sent them to Bethlehem, um, uh, even though they were calling the star and not him. Um, and he said, go and search carefully for the young child. Of course, he was uh, lying, uh, saying that he wanted to worship God, which is not true. But the idea here is we need to get information from others when we feel that there are these little foxes that are threatening our spiritual life. Right? So when other people begin to warn us about our mistakes um, or shortcomings, um, pride will tell us, I don't want to hear it. Who are you to tell me this? But if, if we realize that our kingship or our royalty um, is being threatened, we have to take action. We have to ignore the fact that we don't know and um, take seriously what other people are trying to tell us. And most of the time, they're trying to tell us this in love. So we shouldn't be overly sensitive because um, this information, yes, it made him angry. It made him troubled, um, but he had to know it, right? So we also need to know um, where we stand in our spiritual life, especially if what tends to happen as, as we get older, we're a certain uh, spiritual level. And then as time goes on, there are these little things that creep in in, in our spiritual life without notice at first, um, and we begin to decline spiritually uh, little by little. And so um, uh, we have to take care and to be shrewd, like we said, as, as uh, the gospel according to Luke says, of the children of this age are more prudent 
or truth, as the Lord says, than the children of, of light. Um, <clears throat> and St. Augustine says this is because, right, they look towards the future. So Herod looked towards the future. Oh, this is a potential threat, not only to me and my kingdom, but also my children. Um, and he says, uh, even when a cheat is praised for his ingenuity, this is what happens in the gospel according to St. Luke, um, Christians who make no such provision of blush. And, and he continues by saying, um, this uh, unjust steward was ensuring for himself um, a life that was going to end. He said, would you not ensure yourself for eternal life? So if there's anything threatening our eternal life, we have to take care of it as soon as possible. Um, and so we take this advice from others, but we also have to do the introspective work in our inner self um, to, to realize where am I now and where I have where have I been? Where can I be? Um, and um, we have to make sure that the, the, the fearful words that were told um, by the Lord to the city of Ephesus in the book of Revelation, I have again this against you that you have left your first love. We don't want to leave our first love. And like St. Gregory, the theologian says, uh, let us not remain what we are, but let us become what we once were. Um, because what were we once out of the baptismal font? We were pure. We were holy. We were Christ-like. We were sinless. Right? <clears throat> so this is our job is to return to that state of sinlessness through the sacraments, especially the sacraments of repentance, confession, and communion. So um, <clears throat> this is basically um, the first lesson that we learn um, from an unexpected uh, teacher uh, here. Um, the second thing that we learn is um, in our spiritual struggle, there is a time for fight and there is a time for flight. There is a time to um, uh, fight against the evil and there is time to flee. And oftentimes, God wants us to flee, which is, which is actually easier and sometimes more successful if we do it in the proper way. And so what do I mean by this? Um, in, instead of the Holy Family uh, insisting to stay in the place that God had allowed for them, uh, for the Christ to be born, um, they left, right? Um, just like the Bible says also um, that we shouldn't necessarily resist the, the sinful person. Um, and so if there is a specific place where sin dwells, like it says in the, um, the commandments to the, to the parents um, and the, um, the people responsible for the, the sponsors responsible for, for the child or even the adult after baptism, um, do not let them go into the place where sin dwells. So this is a temporary solution, not the final step, but initial step. Um, sometimes um, we need to make sure that we are not becoming like the people of the world. Right? We are in the world, but we are not of the world. And we are called to rise above the, the, the worldly things and the physical things um, to the heavenly and the spiritual things. But sometimes after a while, even this happened in the history with the Jews, um, after a while, they, be, they began to be um, tempted to be like the people all around them because this was the common thing and this was the popular thing. Um, <clears throat> so this tendency is, is very um, common throughout history and, and that's why we have to be aware of it. Um, <clears throat> even the three holy youth had this temptation. Um, they refused to change their names. They refused to change their dress. They refused to change um, their, uh, their food um, because they wanted to keep the things that were uh, delivered to them with faithfulness. Um, <clears throat> so we have to do whatever we can to remove the potential or the real negative influences in our life. And if that means getting up and leaving or moving, sometimes it's not just that, but or just leaving the, the circumstances that we are currently in with a discussion of people or um, watching something but whatever it might be we have to leave we have to flee um, <clears throat> and uh, the Lord says this through St. Paul the Apostle in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter says 10 he says 
God is faithful who will not you allow to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape um, that you may be able to bear. So sometimes we feel that certain trials or temptations in our life are too big. But St. Paul says, no, God will give you a way of escape. Whether it's the wisdom to know I have to get up and leave um, or um, he'll send you someone to strengthen you um, uh, or um, even like with the um, righteous saints in the Old Testament like Enoch and Elijah, he, he took them away. Um, as uh, St. Paul says in the book of the Hebrews, he says, by faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not taste death. Um, and then later on he says, God had taken him um, so that uh, wh why? Um, because of the testimony that he pleased God. So if we please God and we strive to please God and we can't endure a certain temptation, and we can't flee. Sometimes there's circumstances we can't flee, but God will give us the way of escape. Um, <clears throat> so um, we have to be vigilant in this uh, aspect um, to, to leave the place of that where sin dwells. Um, even if you know the story of the righteous Joseph in the book of Genesis, where he left the place of, of sin um, with the wife of Potiphar, his master. He even left, left his garment in her hands so he could escape. Um, uh, St. Mark, the apostle, actually did the opposite in this case when it came to the, to the, uh, uh, the time of the crucifixion and the passion of the Lord and his arrest. They, they grabbed him. And he, he ran away, um, leaving the garment in, the, in the, those people's hands. But this was out of fear. So when we flee, we don't flee out of fear. But we flee with faith. And we, we fear not the, the people that we are with, but we fear ourselves. We, we feel our weakness. We fear, we fear um, the fact that we might not be as strong as we initially thought. And that's a good thing to think. We get the, we get the strength from God. But when it comes to temptation, we assume that we are weak. And, and um, maybe God will not uh, protect us with his strength. Um, maybe he will just allow a, a place or opportunity to escape rather than to fight. <clears throat> um, so uh, I think in, in general, those are um, the, the basic points um, uh, relating to um, fleeing and being careful that the foxes don't ruin the vine. And so that we can bear fruit. <clears throat> and the last point or question that people have about this is, um, as St. John Chrysostom mentions, he says, Herod acted very unjustly. Why did God allow this? Oftentimes when there is evil in the world, people say, well, how could a God who is loving allow this to happen? <clears throat> and St. John Chrysostom has many reasons for this, um, especially too. Um, actually, at the end, he says there might be many other reasons in the wisdom of God um, that, that, that could be. But he says the, the two main reasons, um, he says, are whatever, first, he says, whatever we may suffer unjustly from anyone, it is meant for the eradication of our sins. And so suffering unjustly for the blessing of the world. He says, whatever we may suffer wrongfully, we are either having our sins mitigated or we are receiving a more glorious crown. So, um, he said, and then later on, he says, um, what about these children? Of course, he says, of course, we didn't have, it's not because their sins were mitigated. It's because God wanted to give them um, a, a, a crown. And so sometimes when we speak to people in the midst of tribulation and we give them these reasons, it, it's not convincing enough. Um, but when we look back in the times that we are not in, severe tribulation, it makes the most perfect sense. So this is where the faith comes in. We have to believe that God loves us and cares for us and arranges our life accordingly if we submit ourselves to him at all times. And then we can accept that, oh, this, this is a wrongful thing in my, in, in my life and I, I don't deserve it. But because I'm a sinner, I, I deserve even worse than this. Um, and that helps us bear it a little bit. And the second thing is, well, even if um, I can't necessarily point um, 
to, to how this tribulation is related to my sins, I still can admit that I am a sinner. And I can still admit that even if I take it patiently, then I will have a reward in heaven regardless. Um, and so um, he says, as St. John Chrysostom says, but it may be said, what, what sin did these children have that they should be killed? He says, did you not hear me say that though they were, though they were, there were no sins, there is a future reward for those who suffer injustice. Um, <clears throat> so there's always a reward for, for any type of suffering that we have here, uh, as long as we cleave to the Lord and depend on him and trust that he will do everything according to his will and his time and for our benefit um, uh, in the long run. So may God give us um, all of his grace and allow us to endure the suffering and to protect ourselves by fleeing when it is necessary and removing um, the foxes that ruin the vine. And glory be to him now and to the age of ages. Blessed are the...